that call on Dr. Richard Dawkins, New College, to speak forth and against the vote. Well, Madam President, you would never think to listen to the philosophical reasonableness of Professor Andrews's speech that here was a Bible-thumping believer in the literal truth of the first chapter of Genesis. Here is a book, From Nothing to Nature, written by Professor Andrews. You are, sir, Professor E. H. Andrews, Professor of Material Science, Queen Mary College. Professor Andrews believes that the world began no more than 10,000 years ago. The truth, as most of you will know from uh, radioactive and other techniques of dating, is between four and 5,000 million years ago. I shall have other occasion to refer to this book later. Yes, sir. I would like to point out that in another book, I have dealt with the question of radiometric dating at great length and would be happy to do so this evening if you wish me to. I've had plenty of time, however, and would not wish to press the matter further. But I will not accept your dismissal of the young age of the Earth as being uh, science against faith. There are scientific reasons for believing in a young Earth. So you, do, you do, sir, then agree that the Earth is no more than 10,000 years old? I agree that that may be the position. That's the position I adopt. Thank you, sir. <laughs> I must say, Madam President, a professional zoologist finds it rather depressing that this debate has to take place at all. To get an idea of how it feels to people like Professor Maynard Smith and myself, Imagine that you're an ancient historian called to the dispatch box to defend the proposition that the Roman Empire ever existed. <laughs> Your opponents in the debate forcefully point out that you can't prove that the Roman Empire ever existed. There are no eyewitnesses, only documents that could be fakes. <laughs> it's only a theory that the Roman Empire ever existed. Faced with this, all you can do is point to numerous facts about the world today, the ruins of Serum and Verulamium and Rome itself, the dominance of Latin words through most of Europe's languages, facts voluminous enough to fill shelf miles in libraries. Evolution, too, is a theory whose truth has no direct eyewitnesses. Obviously, there could be no eyewitnesses to events that took place so long ago. But evolution, too, has left its evidence in the world today. Not just a few fragments of evidence, but volumes and volumes and volumes of evidence, which Professor Maynard Smith and I spend our professional lives immersed in. We obviously can't pre present much of it to you this evening. By its nature, it's not a single elegant proof, like the proof of Pythagoras' theorem. You can't prove evolution to be true. By its very nature, it's a piling on top of one another of literally millions of facts, all of them exactly what the theory of evolution would expect. The logical status of the evidence for evolution is just the same as the logical status for the evidence that the Roman Empire existed. And the strength of the evidence is as great. There's not the slightest shadow of a doubt in the mind of anybody who seriously considered the matter that the theory of evolution is true. How then was it possible for you, Madam President, to dredge up four speakers in favour of this motion tonight? <laughs> I must say, I am rather shocked to discover that two of the internal, well, the two internal speakers for the motion are students of theology. If they'd been students of material science or pharmacology, I could have understood it. But theologians of all people should know better. I'm 
always being bombarded by theologians and others with creationist literature. And I brought along a couple of good things. One is Professor Andrews' book, as I've said. The other is a good one here. The Handy Dandy Evolution Refuter. <laughs> designed to be carried around, provides the answers to practically every question the evolutionist can raise based on the the latest scientific evidence. Try on your friends. How old is the Earth? Amaze them with your knowledge of the radiometric clock. Be the first on your block to really know the truth about life on other planets, the greenhouse effect, (laughs) and lunar tides. Capture the conversation with your discussion of the Mississippi River Delta and growth rates of the human race. (laughs) I looked up growth rates of the human race. It's a good one. It says, if you take the natural rate of increase of the human population, doubling time, and you consider that the human race started a million years ago, by now, the human race would be so large that we would entirely fill the solar system out to the orbit of Pluto. (laughs) I was sufficiently impressed with this argument to repeat it for the case of rats, and I calculated that the Earth must be no more... Well, the Earth must have started in about 1940 or thereabouts, otherwise, again, the solar system... (laughs) be filled with rats out to the orbit of Pluto. (laughs) Now, the other book that somebody has kindly provided me with is From Nothing to Nature by Professor E. H. Andrews. I read this book from cover to cover. I have two things to say to you, sir. One is that you're a very good writer. The other, I think we better preserve the decencies of debate. I will simply um, quote various... uh, passages from this book. Professor Andrews, as I say, believes that the world is no more than 10,000 years old. Um, He believes, he suspects that the sun and the stars may have been created four days after the earth because of Genesis verse 14, but thinks that there may be a let out here in Exodus chapter 20 verse 11. (laughs) in recommending this book. Um, As I say, it's called From Nothing to Nature. I have said it's extremely well written, and those are not words that I utter lightly. And perhaps the professor would like to donate a copy to the library. (laughs) Now, I propose to continue to quote from from this book. (laughs) On page 52, it is obvious that this sorting out of genes, this is referring to um, sexual reproduction and the um, dispersal of genes in that manner, it is obvious that this sorting out of genes can never make one kind of animal or plant change into another. However, the different genes are sorted out. All the genes belong to that kind of creature. You do not get rabbit genes in hares or squirrels. You do not have monkey genes in man. All the genes in man are human genes. Well, I'm sorry to say I have news for you, Madam President and Honourable Members. That's about as wrong as it can be. The biochemical techniques of Alan Sarich, Vincent, uh, sorry, Vincent Sarich, Alan Wilson and others have shown that more than 90% of the genes in man are monkey genes. That's just a simple fact of biochemistry. If we look at chimpanzees instead of monkeys, the figure rises to an even higher percentage. This, by the way, is is one of the main reasons how we know that chimpanzees are our closest relatives and how we know that we are far closer cousins to chimpanzees than chimpanzees are to orangutans. That kind of evidence is, in my opinion, by the way, perhaps 
the most persuasive evidence of all for the theory of evolution. Um, the, the fact that as you look at the animal kingdom, you find that there is a, an orderly hierarchical tree of resemblance, particularly with respect to molecules. And this hierarchical tree is very, in a very great deal of detail interpretable as a tree of cousinship. So you have close cousins who resemble each other a lot, more distant cousins who resemble each other uh, more distantly. Yes, sir. On a point of information, sir, this dispatch box bears a great resemblance to that dispatch box and the differences are very slight. Are we therefore to deduce that this kind of dispatch box evolved from that kind of dispatch box? <laughs> Madam President, I'm simply at a loss. I cannot... <laughs> Would the Honourable Member like to clarify his point and say what it has to do with evolution? <laughs> yes, I, I would very much like to do so, since the Honourable Gentleman's point appeared to me, and I'm sure to most honourable members, to be that the fact that there is genetic similarity between one species of animal and another, it can be taken as evidence that the one derived from another. Let me expand on the point a little bit. The genetic similarity that we observe in different species is seen in parallel in a wide variety of different molecules, each one of stupendous complexity. If you plot a tree of cousinship based upon one kind of molecule, then you will get a particular kind of family tree. You then go and do the same thing with a different molecule, and lo and behold, you find the same tree. Go and do it with a third molecule, and you find the same tree. Now, that's exactly the pattern you would expect to find if they had evolved from distant ancestors or more recent ancestors for closer cousins. I find that exceedingly persuasive evidence. By the way, it's rather similar to the kind of evidence that I suspect textual scholars use when they compare documents. Come now to page 55 of this admirable book. Yes. I sorry, I didn't catch that word. Drawn up. Yes. Yes, that mammals are only insects, or a revised version derived from arachnids. Derived from what? Arachnids. Yes, what, what are derived from arachnids? It's by the history of analysis of biochemical features, leads to that view, and that's a standard text, which I'm sure we would do. Did you say that Lovetrup believes that mammals are derived from insects? This is clearly a book that I must study. I, 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 I apologise for not being familiar with it. I'd be prepared to bet a very, very substantial sum that it's wrong, but obviously I can't do that until I'm a little bit more I'm not sure. Yes. I think that uh, you've got to clarify your mind on just one point about the uh, similarities showing phylogenetic relationships. Take this point, it only take a minute to do. If you can copy certain genes today, say the insulin gene, the human insulin gene can be copied. Sanger did it in Cambridge some years ago. Now, if it were possible, uh, when I was a zygote, now, we put the copied zygote into a womb which is just right for nidation, and then we put the real zygote from which you copied it into the same womb, and in nine months you get twins come out. Now I submit it to you as a geneticist, uh, the two twins, you say, and you say, well, they're identical twins, and they are. Now, the error in your thought comes from saying that because the two identical twins are identical, therefore they are phylogenetically related. They are not. They are related in the mind that copied them. 
So you see, you've got to be perfectly clear when you see a gene which looks like another. You mustn't say that it's automatically phylogenetically related. It's related from the point of view of the concept or the code which is behind it. It's a codal relationship, and a codal relationship has nothing to do with natural law. Madam President, did that come out of my time or... or <laughs> that was part of Professor Wilder Smith's speech, which I'm looking forward to hearing the, the rest of. It's, of course, perfectly true that if you imagine thought experiments like that, you can do all kinds of tricks, but we're talking about natural processes. And in natural processes, what I've suggested is a very valid uh, logical deduction. Now, I'm trying to get this quotation out and having trouble with this. <laughs> It has been worked out that the chances of a gene mutation surviving are so small that it would take between a thousand and a million generations to replace completely the original gene. Uh, Professor Maynard Smith may wish to um, make a note of that uh, and do a few sums while he's listening to the rest of my speech. <laughs> that is just one gene, but a complicated creature like man has something like 20,000 genes most of them different, as far as we know, from the genes of a chimpanzee. Uh, again, as far as we know is a bit further than that. Uh, most of them are the same as a chimpanzee, but still. From these and other figures, it seems that for chimpanzees to turn into man would take at least 20 million generations, i.e. at least 400 million years. Now, I don't want to carp at the facts there. They're all wrong, but never mind about that. Let's look at the logic. The logic goes like this. We have a thousand generations necessary to replace each gene, and we have 20,000 genes to replace. Therefore, the entire process will take 20 million generations. That's to say, a thousand times 20,000. Now, that's a wonderful piece of logic. That assumes that each gene that is replaced has to wait for the previous one to finish the job before it starts on its course. Why on earth should they queue up in series like an amazingly patient queue? Why shouldn't it occur in parallel? Of course it does. Um, when we ourselves mimic Darwin's process of selection in domestic animals, uh, what we find when we breed cattle for milk, um, hens for eggs and so on, what we find is that genes change in sweets, in clusters together. Now, Let's come to the fossil record, which we're frequently told is full of gaps, and we were by the first honourable speaker this evening. The fossil record's full of gaps. Well, of course the fossil record's full of gaps. What on earth do you expect? When you do human history, you don't expect to find a complete narrative record of everything that happened every single day of history. You do your history, you piece it together from here a, a letter, there a diary, there a bit of pottery, there a legal bill of sale. If there weren't gaps, you'd think there was something pretty funny going on, and what's more, you wouldn't have space in your archives to keep all the records. And we wouldn't have space in our museums to keep a tiny fraction of the fossils if every animal and every species, indeed, that had ever lived had fossilised. Now, so we have fossils, and the fossil record, in spite of the gaps, provides overwhelmingly strong evidence for evolution. At its crudest level, this evidence consists of an orderly sequence in which the major groups of organisms appear successively in higher and therefore more recent strata. Professor Andrews uh, knows this very well, of course, and he quotes, um, as we work up through the layers, um, we get from... Um, early creatures, trilobites and sponges, um, uh, other groups of sea fish, starfish, corals, snails, bivalves, followed by lungfish and sharks. Higher up the geological column in the so-called carboniferous layers, we find for the first time fossils of insects and amphibians. Further up still, so-and-so reptiles, bony fish, tooth birds, dinosaurs. Finally, in the upper layers of rock, we find the fossils of birds, mammals, and man. Well, obviously, this orderly progression is a gift to evolutionists, but... Creationists aren't beaten yet. Here is a quote from Professor Andrews, his explanation for the orderly progression of fossils. It was all due to Noah's flood, you see. 
The order of the fossils may simply be the order in which they were trapped by the flood waters. In the lowest layers of sediment, we would find creatures of the sea bottom. Then next, swimming sea creatures caught by the enormous amounts of sediment swept into the seas by water running off the land. Next in order would come river creatures and amphibians living near the water. Then the slow-moving land creatures. Last of all, to be overwhelmed by the flood would be the mammals, able to move to high ground and escape the flood until the last moment. And of course the birds. That is exactly what is found. Now, that is... Oh, sorry. I've been told to speak up, I'm sorry. This astonishing idea that the ordinary progression of animals in the fossil record could be explained by the rate at which they got drowned in the flood, the idea that mammals, being brighter or more nimble, could take to the hills and reach the higher land, reach the higher ground before the floodwaters engulfed them. It's an astonishing piece of special pleading for a start. It also makes the assumption that there's not a single exception to the rule. Quoting Professor Michael Ruse, there was not one human being or horse or cow or fox or deer or hippopotamus or tortoise or monkey who was so slow or so stupid or so crippled that he, she, it lagged behind. Not one. Conversely, there was not one dinosaur or trilobite or mammoth that was lucky enough or clever enough or fast enough to climb to the top of the hill and thus escape the fate of its fellows. Yes, sir. Could you speak up? Where, where is the... He says a human skull was found in a coal bed. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. There are quite a few parallel examples to this. A human skull found in a coal measure, human footprints found in dinosaur beds. I hadn't heard about the human skull in a coal bed. If it's anything like the human footprints found in dinosaur beds, it's a known hoax. Madam President, I cannot believe that more than a handful of the people getting through the net of our admissions procedure will take seriously. <laughs> any argument in favour of the literal truth of the first chapter of Genesis. Nevertheless, I'm sure there will be many who, while they sincerely believe in evolution, so I've been taking a lot of interruptions, and I think my time is running out. Do I have time to take any more? Okay, I can, I can take more. That was the thing that I stated. We were, when we're talking about the doctrine, I, I read it out. I said the doctrine of creation is more valid than the theory of evolution, and you've been trying to make the doctrine of creation a theory of creation, and we're discussing the doctrine of creation. Sir, so you may be discussing. It says, it says the doctrine of creation is more valid than the theory of evolution. There is a problem in, dis in deciding exactly what we mean by the doctrine of creation. I have taken it to mean what the preceding speaker in the debate means by it, which is very, very clearly laid out in his book. I have been treating it as being a literal interpretation of Genesis, which is precisely what he takes it as in this book. Why not? Very well. I wish then to speak to people who are believers in evolution and who are sincere Christians or followers of other faiths, who are deeply religious, who believe in evolution and who feel that perhaps God may have had a hand in it. There may be many who would agree with the official Roman Catholic doctrine that the theory of evolution is definitely true, but that God injected an immortal soul uh, in, the, in the past few million or thousand years. 
Now, those of you who hold some such perfectly sensible views would, as we've just heard, be properly embarrassed by a um, fundamentalist case such as you find in this book. You may wish to abstain on the grounds that although the theory of evolution is obviously valid, so also perhaps on another level is the doctrine of creation. I would urge people in this middle ground category not to abstain, but to vote against the motion for the following two reasons. First is a simple logical one. The motion states that creation is more valid than evolution. Therefore, if you think that both are valid, as you're entitled to do, one can't be more valid than the other, and so you should therefore vote against the motion. But there's a more important reason for voting against this motion. Even if you have sensible, non-fundamentalist reasons for hankering after some kind of sophisticated creationism, suppose that this motion tonight were carried it would be reported in the press. It would be interpreted by the world outside as a straight vote for the yahoos of fundamentalism. The fundamentalist lobby would get hold of it and would exploit it to the full. Whether we like it or not, Oxford has a reputation in the world. <laughs> would you like the name of Oxford to go down in history together with the monkey trial of Dayton, Tennessee, to go down with Sophie Sam Wilberforce. <laughs> yes, sir. Just a very brief comment, sir. You were accusing me recently of special pleading. <laughs> <laughs> I accept that, sir. <laughs> Madam President, the evidence for, over, for, for evolution is overwhelmingly strong. But that isn't the only reason for believing in it. I believe in it not just because of the evidence, strong though that is, but for what is in some ways a more profound reason. I believe in evolution because it is a big enough theory to do justice to the magnitude of the problems of existence. Darwin's theory is a big enough theory to stand up to an expanding universe tens of billions of light years across. Darwin's theory is a big enough theory to feel at home in a time span thousands of millions of years long. The creationist theory as put forward in Genesis, and whatever the other house may say, that is the view of the leading speakers on the other side of the house. I've read both their books. The creationist theory is, by comparison, a little theory conceived by well-meaning but ignorant people in an age when the Earth was thought to be the center of the universe and thought to be only a few thousand years old. The creationist theory is not worthy of the universe in which we now live. We animals are the most complicated things in the known universe. Those of us on this side of the house who have spent our whole professional lives studying biology, unlike anybody on the other side of the house, would yield to nobody in our sense of awe and wonder at the complexity and beauty of living things. The human body is built of cells. There are more cells in a human body than there are bricks in all the houses in the whole of London. Yet unlike a brick, each one of those cells is a complicated machine with a central memory base of information in digital code equivalent to four copies of the complete 30-volume Encyclopedia Britannica. To explain facts like those, we need a big theory. Darwin's theory of evolution has risen to... I've taken enough questions from you, madam, thank you. Darwin's theory of evolution has risen to the challenge. It does not, of course, explain them as a result of chance, as we heard on the other side. That's one of the silliest of all travesties. Natural selection is the very antithesis of chance. The key to the Darwinian explanation of the complexity of life is that it all happened very gradually. 
It is, of course, impossible to imagine anything as complicated as a human being or even a hemoglobin molecule arising out of nothing by chance. Of course it is. But it is possible to imagine